Good morning and welcome. I'm Jason Marzak, Director of the Agent Arts Latin America Center at the Atlantic Council. Thank you so much for joining us for this incredibly important conversation today on how to support meaningful participation of Venezuelan women in the ongoing negotiation in Mexico, as well as the agreements that can arise from that process. I want to begin by thanking the incredible speakers who are joining us for these three conversations today. President Laura Chinchilla, Director General Sarah Cohn, Deputy Assistant Secretary Kevin O'Reilly, Subdirector Antonio Garcia Roger, Mariela Magallanes, Indira Ubaneja, and Beatriz Borges. Thank you for your partnership in helping to raise awareness and generate action around the role of women in the Venezuela negotiation. Now, as members of the opposition and representatives of the Maduro administration sit down in Mexico in an effort to reach agreements on humanitarian aid and upcoming regional elections, Venezuelan women are disproportionately impacted by the country's crisis. Data from ECLAC and the last Venezuelan census illustrate that Venezuelan women are increasingly the heads of their households. Yet, as shown in the Encobi report released last week, women continue to experience significant roadblocks to full labor participation and political representation. Outside of the country, women compose a significant part of the Venezuelan diaspora but are disproportionately suffering from exploitation and marginalization in their host countries. Now, as those on the front lines of their country's economic and political challenges, Venezuelan women possess unique insights to shape informed policymaking and bring about a resolution to the country's political crisis. Women must also be essential stakeholders in the country's long-term future, but they are far from having meaningful participation when key political decisions are made. Last week, both parties in the negotiations in Mexico agreed on the need to include a gender-based perspective to policy issues under discussion. This further underscores the timeliness of our conversation today, with Venezuelan female leaders across the political spectrum and civil society, alongside diverse representatives of the international community. Our goal today, to identify measurable, actionable items for allies across the hemisphere and beyond to take in supporting democratic efforts in Venezuela that include women's full participation. Today's event is also accompanied by a new campaign in Venezuela, the United States and beyond, using the hashtag Venezuela Necesita Acuerdos. We invite you all to join us on Twitter to promote and amplify this message. This campaign is led by members of the Red de Pollo, a network of 60 Venezuelan women legislators, interim government ambassadors, and civil society leaders, and is organized in coordination with Venezuelan NGOs, diaspora-based public servants, civil society activists, thought leaders, and industry representatives to increase awareness of Venezuela's negotiations while ensuring accountability for negotiators' promise of female inclusion. This event kicks off the first portion of the Adrian Arch Latin America Center partnership with Global Affairs Canada and local partner Universidad Católica Andres Bello. This partnership will advance a coordinated multi-pronged campaign to promote women's influence and decision-making power over Venezuela's peace-building efforts and galvanize new gender-based voices of non-traditional democratic actors in Venezuela. With that, I'd like to introduce the keynote speaker to kick off our event, President Laura Chinchilla. President Chinchilla is a role model and leader for women across the hemisphere. The first women president of Costa Rica, she is a leading regional voice in international affairs, sustainable development, democracy, human rights, and women's issues, and is an incredible partner in this effort with our Red de Pollo. I'm also proud to say that she is a member of the Adrian Arch Latin America Center's Advisory Council. I'm going to now pass it over to Adriana Dalia to moderate a conversation with President Chinchilla. Adriana is a senior fellow at the Adrian Arch Latin America Center. She's a senior counselor for Venezuela at the Inter-American Development Bank and an invaluable member of the Center's Women in Venezuela programming. This conversation will be in Spanish, but Samuel Trans translation is available using the interpretation button for those watching on Zoom. Adriana, over to you. Thank you, Jason. Gracias, Jason. Y en verdad, gracias al Atlantic Council. Thank you, Jason. Thank you so much to the Atlantic Council for its support, not just in this event, but the whole project, which is supporting women's role in politics and helping them raise their voices. 
And I just don't have the words to properly thank President Chinchia, not just for supporting this event, but all the support that she has been providing to the women who make up the Red de Apoyo ne network. It's really been invaluable, and this experience is going to enable us to be a real agent for change in Venezuelan politics. President Chintia, I'd like to begin by asking, as the first woman to be elected president of your country, you know firsthand the profound challenges involved in ensuring uh, equal participation for women in politics. So what lessons learned could you offer Venezuela and Venezuelans in our network? as we are now undertaking this negotiation process in Mexico so that we can lay down the groundwork for equal inclusion of women in our country's fu political future. Well, good morning to everyone. Thank you to the Atlantic Council for the invitation, Jason, Domingo, everyone supporting this important initiative. which involves so many Venezuelan women leaders. And I'm so happy to be here with Adriana in this conversation. You know, Adriana, I think the first thing to highlight is that this prolonged crisis has created one of the worst uh, humanitarian crises our hemisphere has seen. And it wasn't a crisis created by women. Quite the contrary, it has been men, certain men in politics, who are responsible for the situation seen in Venezuela. And I think that it brings us to a clear, a clear conclusion. Women have been absent and needed in those central roles to create alternatives to this crisis. We are, I think, more than ready to make that statement. Women are not responsible for this, and in part, it is due to a lack of a proper role for women. So this is a timely initiative, and we need to strengthen it in every way possible. In any negotiation process, and, and I agree with the hashtag, Venezuela needs agreement. Yes, but not just any agreement. It can't be an agreement that turns its back on essential principles such as transparency. We mustn't give up on basic principles that ensure not only movement towards democracy, and elections. It has to be an inclusive process. I think that one of the main conclusions to be drawn today with regard to Venezuela is that there is a need for more women to be seated at the table right now as agreements are forged in Ven Mexico. We have a, two women, one of them in a secretary position. And I don't mean to downplay that. We're talking about a very capable woman, and it's an important role. I'm just saying we need more women in key positions. This moment is vital, not just because of the dialogue underway, but because of the upcoming regional elections to be held in November. We must pay clo close attention to the results and ensure support for those women who have that commitment to democratic values and to enable them to actually have a chance at winning. We must be clear, based on experience, and it's been my experience too, women are excellent negotiators. We generally have more of a knack for negotiation than men. We are more capable of putting ourselves in the other person's shoes. 
And we are much more scrupulous in terms of adhering to fundamental principles. We tend much more to ensure transparency than men have traditionally been able to do. And we have that ability to feel compassion, which I believe is vital in conflict resolution. So to wrap up, yes, we want more agreements in Venezuela. We're very clear on that. But we need to add that Venezuela needs its women in central negotiating roles. I agree with you. And one of the things that concerns us is that the presence of women in political life and regular life is in jeopardy because, as you say, women are suffering the burden of the terrible, terrible crisis disproportionately at the economic and, and social level. And that makes it harder for us to participate in these different spheres locally and internationally to find solutions for our countries. It's just one more challenge. So in that regard, I'd like to ask you, the, the principal message of the campaign being launched today with the Red de Apoyo focuses on collective action of women and men in different sectors and ideologies towards a common objective to raise the role of Venezuelan women in the making decisions that could define Venezuela's future, which is why that we need to find agreements amongst the different political um, thought groups. And that's why we have that hashtag, Venezuela needs agreements. In your experience, the former president as a leader, how can you build those diverse alliances that are inclusive so that we can support sustainable efforts to ensure gender parity in a country with as many challenges as Venezuela has? In his introduction to this event, Jason highlighted something that you again highlighted that the crisis has hit women disproportionately. And this is nothing new, Adriana. We know that if history has taught us anything, it's that any crisis hits women disproportionately. COVID-19 has eloquently uh, served as an example of that. It was women were hit much harder than men. We saw that in terms of loss of jobs, informality in jobs. Um, they have a greater role in the health sector, so it's hit them harder there than the domestic violence, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So in that regard as well, one can presume that if you could break down in detail all the data surrounding the crisis in Venezuela, we would confirm that it's been so there as well. So every effort needs to be made because when we discuss the humanitarian crisis, we really need to break it down. Because if you could actually attach numbers to what women are experiencing, then I think that that makes it easier to implement the policies that are needed, that we're calling for to help Venezuela in the future. And those agreements that we reach along the way need to be inclusive and validate women's roles. And not just because it's a justice issue because women are 50% of the population. It's not a human rights issue. No, it's because women contribute a great deal that they strengthen any process. They strengthen decision-making. So those, that participation is better. And that's what's going to help us do that kind of 
affirmative action, the kinds of quotas that ensure women's participation and determining what measures should be taken so that women can delegate caretaking more within their homes, because that is one of the factors that continues to hold women back and participating in certain ways. And lastly, and very importantly, is the role of social norms, stigma that women suffer. So this type of initiative helps enormously to have more effective campaigns that highlight the role of women in ensuring uh, agreements and peace. And thank you, President. Just to wrap up in just a minute or two, do you have any messages of hope that you can share with anyone who's listening with us today? In just a minute, do you have a message of hope? Because that's something we need. Well, thank you. My message for women fighting today in Venezuela and I would love to add Nicaraguans to this. I would like to call on you, the Nicaraguan women who are fighting for democracy to join with Venezuelan women who are fighting for democracy and all women fighting for democracy in the hemisphere to share lessons, to find the way to derive strength from this fight. The Atlantic Council has positioned itself as a place for women. Like creemos. Muchísimas gracias desde nuestro gracias corazón, a todo el agradecimiento. Gracias a ustedes de nuevo. Contigo entonces, Domingo. Muchas gracias, Adriana, y gracias, Presidenta Chinchilla, por brindarnos esas palabras de esperanzas para las mujeres eh, venezolanas. Mariela, Indiri, Indira y Vivi, bienvenidas. Y un gusto contar con ustedes para esta próxima importante discusión. En esta sección escucharemos las perspectivas de tres lideresas venezolanas sobre cómo el proceso de negociación en México pudiera ofrecer oportunidades para la participación igualitaria de las mujeres en la construcción e implementación de acuerdos políticos y humanitarios. Esta conversación está centrada, como hemos mencionado, en acciones concretas para elevar el rol de la mujer desde un mensaje unido desde diferentes sectores e ideologías. Antes de comenzar, quisiera invitar a nuestra audiencia hispanohablante a unirse y participar de nuestra campaña en Twitter con el hashtag Venezuela Necesita Acuerdos. Y antes de comenzar, quisiera presentar a las tres ponentes que me acompañan hoy. Marila Magallanes es diputada por el Estado de Aragua y miembro de la delegación de la Plataforma Unitaria en México. Ha participado de las tres rondas de negociación y ha liderado diálogos sobre género y otros incluyendo los que culminaron en el compromiso de la última ronda hace dos semanas. Indira Urbaneja es jefa de la ONG Reunificados y asesora de campañas políticas. Hoy no pertenece a ningún partido, pero militó por muchos años en el chavismo. Y Beatriz Borges es abogada y directora ejecutiva del Centro para Justicia y Paz. Bueno, con eso quisiera comenzar contigo, Mariela, haciéndote eh, esta primera pregunta. Un resultado importante, María, de la pasada ronda del proceso de negociación en México fue el compromiso explícito de ambas partes de, y aquí cito, asegurar un enfoque de género en el desarrollo del diálogo y la negociación, así como en los acuerdos que lleguen a alcanzarse. Cierro cita. Mariela, ¿qué significa esto en práctica de cara a las próximas rondas de diálogo? Y aún más importante, ¿cómo se puede traducir esto en acciones concretas que garanticen la participación igualitaria 
en la implementación de los acuerdos. Buenos días a todos. Para mí un gran honor estar aquí, agradecida con la Atlantic Council por esta iniciativa, iniciativa que se ha venido construyendo a raíz de la necesidad de visibilizar eh, el apoyo al proceso de negociación, sobre todo al, al saberse que este proceso incluiría no solamente mujeres, sino que tendría una, una importancia para nuestro país, para el rescate de la democracia y, por supuesto, para la inclusión este, de todos los sectores y, en particular, de las mujeres. Gracias a todos los presentes y, por supuesto, saludo a la presidenta Laura Chinchilla, a Sara Cohen, a eh, Kevin O'Reilly, eh, a Antonio García Roger y eh, honrada también de estar en este panel con Indira Urbaneja y Beatriz Borges, que eh, como venezolanas se me consta porque así lo hemos vivido, hemos construido también caminos para allanar, no solamente para la inclusión de mujeres, sino también para allanar el camino para el rescate de la democracia. Y efectivamente, eh, Domingo, bueno, y a todo el staff de Atlantic Council que, que, que ha estado presente entre ellos, Domingo y Diego y y eh, Isabel, eh, que en este proceso de negociación tenga un enfoque de género este, acordado por ambas partes, es una oportunidad que tenemos las mujeres venezolanas, las organizaciones no gubernamentales, entre otros, y yo diría que eh, más allá de la región, visibilizar el impacto social, económico y político de nuestra crisis en las mujeres, niñas y adolescentes, y en especial y sobre todo en la familia. Nosotras somos quienes llevamos principalmente el peso de la crisis, teniendo que asumir responsabilidades integrales, por ser precisamente, en su mayoría, cabezas de hogar. Esto obliga a la sensibilización de los negociadores a tomar decisiones para eliminar la brecha de género que existe en el país. Es un reto y un desafío para Venezuela el de impulsar a la sociedad para hacerle seguimiento y formar parte directa de este proceso. Las medidas que se tomen no pueden excluir el impacto que deben tener los, eh, en todos los ámbitos, ya que estos acuerdos deben ir en consonancia a la resolución del conflicto. Desde nuestra delegación sabemos lo importante que tenemos y que tiene para este proceso la incorporación de más mujeres, sobre todo por el mismo interés de la mujer de que haya una solución política y una solución a la crisis que permita que estos acuerdos sean duraderos en el tiempo y sienten las bases para devolver la democracia y reconstruir el país. Yo, eh, como creyente, eh, y igualmente eh, sabiendo la importancia para nosotras las mujeres, todo lo que tiene que ver con los valores, en la Biblia hay un, un pasaje que cita que así como el hambre es dura, más dura es la sed. Y yo haciendo la analogía eh, de lo que sucede en Venezuela, nosotros tenemos hambre de democracia y libertad, pero sobre todo tenemos sed de justicia. Y esa justicia que tanto añoramos los venezolanos nos llevará también a la reconciliación entre nosotros como país y con nosotros mismos como individuos y seres humanos. Eso quiere decir que parte de lo que nosotros tenemos como compromiso y responsabilidad como mujeres que estamos participando directamente no solamente en el proceso, sino que vivimos la crisis que vive nuestro país, tenemos también la responsabilidad de reconciliarnos como país, como reconciliarnos como venezolanos para poder allanar el camino a vivir en un mejor país y, por supuesto, en democracia. Esto forma parte de las iniciativas que se tienen que tomar y, por supuesto, que nosotras tengamos también la posibilidad de seguir impulsando acuerdos que sean duraderos en el tiempo y que sean acuerdos por el bien de los venezolanos, por el bien del país y por el bien de la democracia. Gracias, Domingo. Muchas gracias, eh, Mariela, por, por esas palabras. Quiero pasar eh, contigo, eh, Beatriz, Vivi. Eh, Vivi, el reporte de Dencovi, de publicado hace una semana, muestra datos muy preocupantes respecto al impacto agravado de la crisis en las mujeres venezolanas. Todo desde salud reproductiva a oportunidades económicas. En este contexto donde la emergencia humanitaria compleja afecta desproporcionalmente a las mujeres y también los flujos migratorios que amenazan con desestabilizar a la región, ¿por qué es tan importante que la mesa de, la, de negociación en México priorice la participación igualitaria de las mujeres, especialmente, pero no exclusivamente, en acuerdos humanitarios que buscan aliviar la crisis? 
Gracias Domingo y bueno, gracias al Atlantic Council y a todos eh, y a todas que están esta mañana aquí y justamente es importante que se priorice en México, pero es importante que pasen estas cosas, que visibilicemos lo que está pasando con las mujeres, lo que está pasando en Venezuela y, y justamente esta, estas conversaciones espero que sean unas de muchas de, de que nos ayuden a profundizar en estos temas. Yo, yo sobre la importancia y la afectación diferenciada que, que, pues, que hemos documentado y que, que siempre de anunciamos, eh, y, pero viéndola de cara al proceso de negociación y sobre todo al proceso de paz que tiene que pasar Venezuela y de reinstitucionalización, eh, creo que es fundamental la, el enfoque eh, y estos dos puntos importantes que se hacen o se reflexionan dentro de lo que es la Agenda de Paz y Seguridad, la resolución 1325 y otra decena de resoluciones del Consejo de Seguridad, que hablan de dos cosas. Primero, esta afectación diferenciada eh, nos habla de, de discriminación, de desigualdad de género que no es ajena al mundo y por supuesto puesto no es ajena en Venezuela y que genera esa desigualdad y esa discriminación también genera las violencias por razones de género y, y que en Venezuela son estructurales, es decir, no, no solamente eh, eh, ocurren ahorita en la crisis, son estructurales, son de vieja data y se agravaron frente a la emergencia humanitaria y frente a la pandemia. Es decir, las emergencias no son, género, no son neutras al género y de allí que han tenido las mujeres en Venezuela y las niñas una afectación diferenciada. En COVID nos mostró eh, y otros informes nos muestran justamente estas varias dimensiones en lo político, en lo social, en lo económico, en la alimentación, eh, de, de cómo están estas brechas de desigualdad y discriminación. Pero yo, yo reflejo dos ¿no? que, que me parecieron importantes. Eh, cuando hablaban del de grupo que descendió su actividad económica, estamos hablando de las personas jóvenes en Venezuela, entre 25 y 35 años. Y hay, en, en el caso de mujeres y hombres, las mujeres tuvo una caída de 12 puntos frente a los 3.5 que tuvo los hombres. Ahí vemos cómo las mujeres venezolanas estamos confinadas a las labores de cuidado eh, eh, se afecta nuestra competitividad económica en un país donde pues depende eh, esa competitividad, la supervivencia de las mujeres y de los niños, y de allí eh, la, el, 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 las mujeres también tienen que salir de Venezuela desesperadamente huyendo para poder sobrevivir, e incluso en el término de los ingresos, sigue ocurriendo en la emergencia humanitaria compleja y en la crisis de la pandemia, como los ingresos de los hombres son 17% más que las mujeres, es decir y, y, y en un país donde entre 60 y 70% de las mujeres son jefas de hogar. O sea, allí con esos datos te muestra una, un, una necesidad de atender las razones de discriminación y desigualdad en Venezuela que afectan a toda la población, pero tienen un impacto este, diferenciado. Son temas invisibles porque no hay datos oficiales, porque los datos que hay, incluso los, los producidos por las propias organizaciones, a veces no están desagregados por sexo y no encontramos esas brechas. Por eso la importancia de discutir estos temas, de analizarlos y ver cómo está afectada las población de mujeres y atender en el espacio de negociación, en todos los espacios de reinstitucionalización posible, los problemas de las mujeres. Y segundo, que es el otro punto de la agenda de paz y seguridad, es que no solamente somos las víctimas, o sea, no solamente somos las que necesitamos ser atendidas, somos parte de la solución y tenemos que estar donde se tomen las decisiones, en esos espacios de poder, no de, del poder entendido como el poder aislado, ¿no? el poder de transformar Venezuela. Nosotras queremos ese poder, ese poder de decidir y y tomar ese poder implica no solamente saber lo que ocurre, estar presentes y que nuestros temas estén presentes, porque normalmente lo que ocurre es que estamos eh, subrepresentadas y no se garantizan nuestros derechos a participación. Venezuela necesita diálogo y encuentro, necesita acuerdos por la gente y la única forma, esa es la única forma de recuperar nuestra democracia y las instituciones, encuentros de hombres y mujeres por nuestros derechos, enfocados en la gente enfocado en todos estos rezados que han habido a lo largo del tiempo y las mujeres no, no podemos estar ausentes nuestros temas deben estar allí la participación debe ser garantizada y así como dice la, la campaña nosotros tenemos que ser guardianes, tenemos que ser dolientes de que se generen estos acuerdos pero también tenemos que participar activamente para que en nuestra voz esté presente, para que este, ese espacio no se sienta cómodo sin la voz y los temas de las mujeres y que esos acuerdos se centren en los venezolanos, en las soluciones y especialmente en las necesidades de las mujeres para que no sean dejadas de luego, sino que sean atendidas en este momento. Excelente, Vivi, mucha, muchas gracias. Eh, y en ese contexto que, que nos cuentas, donde las mujeres venezolanas son impactadas desproporcionalmente por la crisis humanitaria, 
Y en ese espíritu de encuentro y, y diálogo, quiero pasar contigo, Indira, para que nos cuentes cómo se puede promover la representación femenina igualitaria en la dirigencia de los partidos políticos y vincular cada vez más a esta dirigencia con la base de los partidos para brindar espacios únicos en la construcción de paz y estabilidad en Venezuela. Indira. Sí, bueno, buenos días. Muchísimas gracias, Domingo, a Tracking Council y a todos los que nos ven y nos escuchan en este momento. Fíjate, Domingo, que tiene que existir un compromiso y voy a ser muy pragmática con mi respuesta. No se puede financiar organizaciones político-partidistas, no se pueden apoyar organizaciones político-partidistas sin primero exigirle de alguna forma su compromiso en mantener una representación no nada más equitativa de mujeres dentro de sus organizaciones, sino también compuestos con responsabilidades que estén acorde al desarrollo de un partido político. Es un tema cultural en Venezuela. Durante todos nuestros años de democracia y de, durante todos nuestros años, digamos, de desarrollo de la política y de las instituciones político-partidistas en Venezuela, la figura de la mujer ha estado de alguna forma encasillada solamente a los asuntos de mujer y de familia. Por lo general, tú ingresas a un partido político en Venezuela y el primer cargo que te ofrecen es el de secretaria femenina, pero vemos muy pocas mujeres siendo, por ejemplo, presidentas de partidos, directoras de organización de partidos, con cargos relevantes o con espacios relevantes. Nos acompañan personalidades de la comunidad internacional, sobre todo Estados Unidos ha tenido un papel importante en las instituciones democráticas de Estados Unidos, siempre están apoyando a los partidos políticos en Venezuela. Yo empezaría por exigirle entonces a un partido que viene a mí a solicitar recursos, que viene a mí a solicitar apoyo, yo empezaría pidiéndole como requisito que la inclusión paritaria, la inclusión equitativa de mujeres en sus estructuras. Yo creo que esa sería una forma buena, una forma lastimosa porque sería un tema de presión, pero yo creo que es la forma o la vía más pragmática en este momento de empezar a obligar de alguna forma, de empezar a fomentar esa cultura de inclusión y de respeto a la mujer dentro de las estructuras partidistas en Venezuela. Gracias, Indira. Y, y mencionabas que hoy nos acompañan los gobiernos de Canadá, de España y de Estados Unidos, eh, quienes todos han tenido y siguen teniendo eh, roles importantes en, en acompañar y promover el proceso de negociación en, en México. Eh, quiero pasar eh, contigo, Mariela, eh, para preguntarte, bueno, tú siendo una de las delegadas eh, en la plataforma unitaria, eh, ¿qué acciones adicionales pueden hacer estos tres países y sus aliados internacionales para seguir promoviendo y asegurar que se incluya tanto el liderazgo y la participación igualitaria de las mujeres en decisiones que serán claves para el futuro democrático de Venezuela. Bueno, primero que nada agradecer a Estados Unidos, eh, Canadá y España por estar hoy aquí presentes apoyándonos, pero también a toda la comunidad internacional del mundo democrático que tiene aún los ojos puestos en Venezuela y que de verdad apuesta por una salida democrática a la crisis política y que nos acompaña también en este proceso de negociación. Que hoy estemos participando mujeres en este proceso es también exigencia de la comunidad internacional y desde adentro hemos impulsado la participación de nosotras las mujeres políticas en instancias de tomas de decisiones que sean de interés y en beneficio para el país. Eso quiere decir que no estamos aquí solo por exigencias externas, sino por exigencias de nosotras mismas, por lo cual nos hemos preparado y sensibilizado sobre esta necesidad. Es un compromiso en mi caso, ya que no puedo hablar en nombre de todas las mujeres, pero sí como mujer venezolana, que está comprometida para que la mujer venezolana se sienta representada en el proceso en sí. Falta mucho, muchísimo. Considero un avance que hoy estemos presentes. Debemos insistir y seguir sensibilizando y visualizando la importancia de estar presente y eso depende también de nosotras. Lo que vivimos en Venezuela es una cruda realidad, lamentablemente, y la demostración esta vez nos las muestra los últimos datos de COVID. Y el valor de esta negociación, y en particular la que hoy está sucediendo en, Venezuela, eh, en México, es seguir apostando por una solución a esta crisis. Y uno de los principales valores de la negociación es para rescatar el respeto humano, la dignidad y eh, de una Venezuela que así lo exige cada vez más. A estos países aliados les pido como mujer, como exiliada, como política, como venezolana, que no dejen de acompañar a los venezolanos y a las venezolanas que siguen juntos eh, eh, este proceso y exigiendo a las partes 
que de este proceso salga eh, una solución para vivir lo más pronto posible en democracia. Exigimos elecciones presidenciales, parlamentarias, libres, pero exigimos también el, 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 eh, la necesidad de, de una sociedad mucho más inclusiva. Las mujeres tenemos la responsabilidad, como lo dije antes, de reconciliar a los venezolanos y no dejen nunca de apoyar esos proyectos que sirvan para empoderar a las venezolanas líderes que estamos prestas a, reco a reconstruir a Venezuela desde ahora y para que esta historia oscura no se repita más y podamos vivir libres de dictadura. Muchas gracias y espero haber respuesto eh, la, la pregunta, Domingo. Sí, gracias Mariela. Como siempre, muy acotado y, y, y bueno, quiero pasar con, con, con Vivi para, eh, en esa misma línea de, de pensamiento, Vivi, desde el Centro de Justicia y Paz, CEPAS, has liderado este, esfuerzos importantes en la promoción del empoderamiento de la mujer, eh, la defensa de los derechos humanos y la cultura democrática en Venezuela. Te pregunto, ¿qué rol pudiera tener la sociedad civil en la implementación de los acuerdos para, para, para garantizar la participación igualitaria de mujeres y establecer mecanismos de seguimiento en el mediano y largo plazo. Nosotros hacemos esta pregunta porque reconocemos que los compromisos que se hagan y los acuerdos que se alcancen en México eh, eh, no serán suficientes sin que se eh, haga una implementación y una ejecución de esos acuerdos en el terreno y existan mecanismos de seguimiento y mecanismos de monitoreo en, y, y en ello que se incluya este, mecanismos para poder eh, medir cómo se está incluyendo la participación de las mujeres en ello. Eh, eh, Vivi, adelante. Gracias, Domingo. Bueno, en efecto, el, el trabajo de la sociedad civil en Venezuela es y ha sido fundamental en todo lo que ha sido este proceso de, de recuperación de la democracia y la consecución de la paz en Venezuela y la construcción de la paz en Venezuela. Y, y creo que una, una de lo que marca pues, la acción es nuestra priorización de las personas como centro. El, el no desconectarse de lo que las personas y su dignidad requieren en este momento en Venezuela. Un ejemplo de eso es cómo la, las organizaciones, especialmente las de derechos humanos, logramos eh, que no solamente el gobierno de Venezuela eh, aceptara que estamos en medio de una situación que ameritaba y amerita a respuesta humanitaria, sino que pudiese estar eh, el, el desarrollarse la, el clúster humanitario y, y toda la estructura humanitaria de las organizaciones de Naciones Unidas. Otro, otro ejemplo también ha sido recientemente, escuchamos de eso, pero ha sido un trabajo de años en, en la reconstrucción de la ruta electoral y donde la asistencia técnica electoral internacional ha sido una demanda y trabajo de años por parte de las organizaciones de la sociedad civil. Eh, y, y frente a lo que ha sido el estancamiento de de, de la situación política desde las organizaciones de la sociedad civil y especialmente desde el foro cívico, que bueno, es un espacio que muchos conocen, donde, donde articulamos sectores eh, que trabajamos para la recuperación de la democracia. Eh, una, un rol fundamental ha sido la interpelación de los actores que buscan generar cambio en Venezuela. Esa, esa dinámica donde no solamente lo estamos documentando, estamos denunciando, sino también interpelamos y vamos hacia los actores donde, donde están esas tomas de decisiones y hacemos incidencia en ellos. Eh, nosotros, eh, nuestro rol como sociedad civil, y, y, y no, digamos, lo hemos pensado mucho, para nosotros en la mesa de negociación, nuestra participación es que los temas y la gente esté presente, y especialmente, y en esta conversación, eh, parte de ellos es que los temas y los derechos de las mujeres estén en la mesa. Somos guardianes, somos dolientes, es nuestra forma de estar en esa mesa esa negociación y por eso desde Sociedad Civil hemos iniciado un proceso que lo hemos denominado Agenda Social y de Derechos, eh, que incluye toda la discusión en los sectores de educación, salud, social, económico, que nos ayuda a construir esa agenda que queremos poner en la mesa de negociación. Nuestra expectativa de México eh, no, es que no sea un espacio simplificado solamente la crisis política electoral. Por supuesto que eso es fundamental en, en, en el tema venezolano, pero que se entienda que eh, eh, este debe ser un espacio que promueva y debe estar combinado con otros elementos de la crisis venezolana. Y cada sentada que se den en la mesa de negociación sea una oportunidad aprovechada para dar respuestas a las necesidades de las personas y además un trabajo para recuperar la democracia. Yo creo que eh, si, si, si vemos el, el espacio de la negociación no hay que eh, repetir esta 
eh, desesperanza aprendida donde vemos que es un espacio fracasado, todo lo contrario, los venezolanos tenemos que apostar a que ese espacio funcione, a que se generen este, acuerdos que vayan más allá de lo político, lo electoral, que tiendan esta respuesta urgente que el país necesita, pero que también piense en un país a largo plazo, de allí la necesidad de acuerdos integrales y parciales, esos parciales que dan respuesta a esta urgencia, a esta necesidad de las mujeres y los hombres en Venezuela de atender sus necesidades básicas y su dignidad, pero eso, ese espacio que piensa también en la Venezuela que se tiene que reconstruir, que pasó 20 años de un naufragio y que hay que reconstruirla a pedacitos y que requiere de cada uno de todos, esa mirada a largo plazo, ese apoyo a largo plazo que nos puede dar también la comunidad internacional va a ayudarnos en esta construcción del nosotros, donde se puedan garantizar los derechos en un momento donde tenemos represión, criminalización pero que especialmente no puede excluir a las mujeres. Nosotros tenemos que estar en los espacios, como decía la presidenta, de poder y protagonismo, y que siempre, no siempre está relegadas a las labores de cuidado y de exclusión, donde, donde no somos las negociadoras, no somos las mediadoras, no somos, somos solamente las que estamos en, en, en la respuesta o, en la, o, en la, o, la, o revictimizadas, sino requerimos ese espacio de liderazgo comunitario, liderazgo en los partidos, eh, no, solamente, no solamente estar en, la, en los espacios de exclusión de allí, que todo, todo esfuerzo que apunte al fortalecimiento del liderazgo de las mujeres en los movimientos políticos, en los sectores, en la sociedad civil y que permita que nuestros temas estén presentes son fundamentales en este, en este momento y por eso eh, creo que esta solicitud de acuerdos por, por, por la negociación tienen que ser acuerdos por las mujeres, acuerdos por esa agenda de derechos para avanzar en la solución de Venezuela pensando en lo urgente pero también en un camino a largo plazo. Excelente, Vivi. Y, y bueno, quiero pasar a la, última, a la última pregunta y tomar ese punto, Vivi, que mencionabas que la reconstrucción de, de Venezuela va a necesitar de todos los venezolanos. Y Indira, eh, tú desde el terreno en Venezuela has liderado esfuerzos importantes con tu ONG reunificados en la promoción precisamente de reconciliación e inclusión. Te pregunto... ¿Cómo se pueden multiplicar esfuerzos existentes y emprender otros para resaltar el potencial, por ejemplo, de una alianza organizada de mujeres de diferentes partidos, trasfondos e ideologías, incluyendo el chavismo, para dialogar sobre los asuntos más urgentes que vive Venezuela hoy y proponer soluciones comunes a la crisis? Bien, Domingo, tú lo has dicho muy bien en tu, en tu pregunta, ¿no? Venezuela necesita acuerdos pero no hay acuerdos, no hay soluciones, no hay ningún tipo de arreglo para el país si no empezamos por dos palabras clave, que es inclusión y diversidad. Entender que la crisis compleja que tenemos en este momento afecta a todos los venezolanos. La falta de insumos médicos, el tema de la pandemia, la falta de vacunas, la inseguridad, todo lo que se ha venido acumulando, esta tragedia que estamos atravesando los venezolanos, afecta a chavistas y a opositores. Por tanto, la crisis venezolana no podemos seguirla viendo parcializada desde lo político partidista o desde lo político ideológico. Por ejemplo, quiero comentar, aprovechar el espacio para comentar desde nuestra ONG, hemos estado impulsando unos proyectos pilotos en los barrios más peligrosos de Venezuela, en este caso de Caracas, barrios como La Vega, barrios como Petare, el 23 de enero. Allí hemos estado convocando unas mesas comunitarias de diálogo, que son mesas comunitarias convocadas y organizadas por mujeres. Yo creo que parte de la iniciativa, y para dejar una idea sobre la mesa, podría ser explorar y llevar este pequeño ejemplo de lo que estamos haciendo en comunidades muy pobres y con muchos problemas que también tienen derecho a opinar sobre lo que necesita el país, sobre las soluciones a la crisis del país, esto lo podemos llevar a macro. Yo creo, Domingo, y creo a todos los que nos escuchan, que este es el momento, estamos en el timing correcto para crear una especie de mesa nacional de diálogo al interno. No para sustituir el diálogo en México, sino para más bien nutrir lo que está sucediendo en México, pero desde Venezuela, con mujeres de todas las tendencias políticas, con mujeres de todas las tendencias ideológicas y partidistas, porque es el momento de demostrar de que el país y las necesidades del país están por encima de las diferencias ideológicas y partidistas. Gran parte de la crisis que tiene Venezuela hoy, esto lo deben de recordar quienes nos escuchan domingo, es que precisamente llegamos a este punto porque dejamos de entendernos como sociedad, porque dejamos de entendernos como país, porque empezamos a dividirnos. Estos son los chavistas y estos son los opositores, quiénes son mejores o quiénes son peores, quiénes son culpables, quiénes son inocentes. Y en ese proceso de degradación y de destrucción de nuestro tejido social, 
Entonces llegamos al punto donde hoy necesitamos de la comunidad internacional para podernos sentar en una mesa y para dialogar, porque la capacidad de diálogo interno se perdió. Entonces las mujeres dando un paso al frente, buscando acuerdos por Venezuela, buscando acuerdos por el país, buscando acuerdos por la gente, las mujeres podríamos tomar la vanguardia y unirnos por encima de nuestras diferencias para conversar, para buscar soluciones y para nutrir el proceso de México. Creo que eso puede ser una propuesta interesante y es lo que dejo en la mesa. Muchas gracias, Indira. Y con eso concluimos eh, esta, esta sección. De nuevo, gracias también a Mariela y a Vivi por, por esta excelente conversación. Quiero pasar la palabra ahora a mi colega y subdirector para estrategia en el Centro para América Latina, Diego Area, para que modere la próxima conversación con nuestros panelistas de la comunidad internacional. Diego, adelante. Gracias, Domingo. Yo, yo, yo me voy a salir un poco del libreto porque quisiera resaltar en castellano todavía lo refrescante y esperanzador de escuchar a, a, este, a estas tres mujeres que acabamos de, de tener la oportunidad de escuchar. Quiero comentar, y perdóname, Vivi y las demás, pero Vivi acaba de sufrir una pérdida familiar importante. Mariela está en el medio, se podrán imaginar lo que significa estar en el medio de este proceso de negociación. Indira moviéndose entre comunidades en Venezuela para promover la reconciliación en el espacio local, como acaba de comentar. Y en el medio de todo esto nos han dado una increíble y valiente participación y lección a todos, considero. Eh, Mariela pidió a la comunidad internacional... Eh, que, no nos, que, que, que no pierdan la atención con respecto a Venezuela, el que estén aquí hoy es una muestra de que hay un compromiso muy importante, pero yo creo que hay que devolverles la pelota a ustedes y darles un mensaje de energía de que los venezolanos que estamos dentro y fuera y la comunidad internacional eh, la, lo, las estamos viendo y no nos vamos a ir de aquí, vamos a seguir vamos a seguir apoyando a este proceso que va a ser largo, difícil y hay que ser resilientes todos para poder tener un, un, un final un final no, no sé si feliz, pero, pero un final que, que, que vuelva a reunificar al país. So, I will, uh, now, ahora voy a pasar a inglés para continuar eh, la conversación. I would now like to turn to English for our next conversation on how the international community can support meaningful women participation during these negotiations, but most importantly, in the implementation of agreements that will come out of the negotiation process. Um, as we just heard from the really insightful previous conversation, There is no easy or quick solution uh, to the Venezuela crisis. And only a long-term and inclusive effort could open pathways for democratic stability um, uh, and the reinstitutionalization of the country. Uh, and to ensure the sustainability of that effort, Venezuelans need the broad and cohesive support of the international community. Before we start, I would like to invite our English-speaking audience to join our social media campaign that will begin immediately following this event. As a reminder, you can join on Twitter using the hashtag Venezuela Necesita Acuerdos. Um, with that, I would like to introduce the speakers for this conversation. Um, first up is Sara Cohen, who is Director General for South America and Inter-American Affairs at Global Affairs Canada. Uh, we're also joined by Kevin O'Reilly, who is Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for the Bureau of Western Hemisphere Affairs of the U.S. Department of State. And last but not least, Antonio Garcia Roger, who is Deputy Director of Andean Countries at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Spain. Welcome all and thank you for joining us today. Um, Director General Cohen, I would like to start with you and thank you for joining. Um, the Canadian government, along with its U.S. and European counterparts, have been supportive of the Norway mediated negotiations. So how can Canada further partner with its international allies in promoting the equal inclusion of women leadership and meaningful representation in the partial agreements being negotiated, such as the creation of the Joint Commission to address the humanitarian crisis? Thank you so much, Diego, and thank you very much for the opportunity to be with you today. You know, it's such a huge pleasure for us to partner with the Atlantic Council and with the Latin America Center on this event uh, with the Red de Apoyo on the series of activities that will come out of this. Uh, quisiera también en español darle eco a, a las palabras de Diego para agradecer a las panelistas previas por su, su liderazgo, por su participación de hoy, su coraje y su fuerza. Uh, our previous panelists have given us some very good ideas and a call to action for the international community, and we, we hope to do what we can to support you in, in these efforts. Uh, and really thank you also to all who are 
who are joining us with the commitment to advancing women's participation in the negotiations and in a peaceful democratic transition in Venezuela. These are priorities for Canada and for many of our partners, and we're really pleased with the collaboration that we've seen to date. We saw very recently coming out of the most recent round of negotiations, a commitment to ensure a gender focus uh, in the negotiations and in the implementation. And I think for that, that is something for Canada that we are watching very closely, uh, that we see as very encouraging and that we hope to support to the extent possible through projects like this and, and other efforts. You know, for Canada, this is fundamentally about the importance of gender equality and the roles that empowered women and girls play in building better future for themselves their communities, their countries, and the world at large. That sounds grand, but I don't actually think it's that grand of a concept. I'll put forward a few a few things in just in answer to your question, Diego, uh, and look forward to further discussions on this. Firstly, for Canada, you know, we need to learn from women's rights organizations in Venezuela and support their work. Uh, we've heard from panelists today, and I think we're all convinced by their message. They are mobilizing to change laws, attitudes, and harmful norms and practices. They're the ones who best understand their local context and how to work for change. A second idea to put forward uh, in answer to your question, Diego, we need to amplify the voices of these grassroots Venezuelan women and women's organizations for them to be heard at the negotiating table by the authorities, by the interim government, by the pro-democracy forces in the opposition and the international community. Women's meaningful participation in the negotiations, as well as the inclusion of other diverse voices, will increase the legitimacy of the negotiations and pave the way for implementation. Just to note on that, uh, we do recognize, of course, that when amplifying women's voices, we, we also have to ensure that they're not put at risk in the process. Uh, this is something that we can come back to uh, to discuss further, but how we can do this to have impact in the short, medium, and long term in a safe way that protects and promotes at the same time uh, is something very important for us all to consider. And this leads fundamentally to my third point. We, we have to advocate and support initiatives to eliminate all forms of violence against women, including online. Women human rights activists and political leaders the world over face disproportionate harassment and violence, including sexual and gender-based violence. They're often subject to denigrating comments on their physical appearance and to social norms that continue to stifle their political aspirations and leadership opportunities. In everything we do from the Canadian perspective, we're guided by our feminist international assistance policy, our development and humanitarian assistance inside Venezuela is advancing gender equality as an integral part of our efforts. For Canada, what this means is the meaningful and equal participation of women and girls in social, economic and political life and the elimination of all forms of violence against women and girls, including online, are critical to a stable, democratic and economically prosperous world. Diego, I could go on at great length, but I'll, I'll leave it there and let you go to the next speaker. Thank you, Dr. Cohen. Um, I would like to continue with you, uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary O'Reilly. Venezuela is yet again in an inflection point with the ongoing negotiations, the upcoming regional elections and uncertainty around the future of the interim government. Um, regional allies and the international community must continue to support efforts to restore democracy in Venezuela. So why is it important for the U.S. to prioritize the promotion of meaningful women participation in these efforts? And ca how can U.S. support in advancing gender parity have a transformative effect in Venezuela's path towards democracy? You know, thanks, Diego. You know, it, it comes down to first principles. In March, our vice president, Kamala Harris, addressed the U.N. Commission on the Status of Women, and she called the status of women, the status of democracy. And she, and she was right. You know, the World Bank calculates right now that there are about half a million more Venezuelan women and girls in this world than uh, Venezuelan uh, men and boys. Um, you know, so over 50% of Venezuela's population of Venezuela's citizens. So like anywhere, Venezuela's democracy, its ability to recover that democracy um, involves some sort of a restitution, you could say. It depends on the inclusion of those citizens, those uh, and representation of the interests of those women and girls. Um, this is not or should not be in any way 
an exceptional or or in any way controversial uh, um, uh, assertion. So their representation in these negotiations logically follows. Uh, the discussions and the debates about the future of their nation, of their society, of their democracy depends on their place at that table. You know, Bibi referred to this before, uh, alluded to this before, you know, there are very practical effects to this. Uh, representation equals responsiveness, responsiveness to the social needs that are perhaps otherwise overlooked by guys, by men, even men of goodwill. Um, and, and Sarah noted one of the primary areas that have traditionally received inadequate attention, violence against women. Um, also questions of, of health and in particular women's health. Um, I would submit that it is usually women who would probably first note their marginalization or exclusion from the labor force. Um, and those are the kinds of indicators as to why half of society, or in this case, apparently more than half of society, merits full and effective uh, representation, participation in deciding the future and course of, um, of society. I'd like to make one more quick point and then I'll, I'll leave it. Authoritarian imposition of any voice, male or female, in politics, um, stands in opposition to democratic values and true representative government. It doesn't represent the will of the people because the people have not had the opportunity to make those choices. It doesn't in itself represent progress. The men and women who participate in representative democratic governance should be chosen in a by the popular will thank you deputy o'reilly great points um i'd like to continue with you subdirector deputy uh, director garcia and I, I i not only have one question but two questions for you so first uh spanish president Pedro sanchez recently recognized the maduro administration as the legitimate government in venezuela i, I would like to get your thoughts on that and second, we saw last week that the European Union confirmed it will send an electoral mission to Venezuela. This is, of course, a really important step in the right direction, but there is still a long list of electoral conditions yet to be achieved. Having been an um, a EU electoral observer yourself, what are your thoughts on the EU decision to deploy this mission and what could it mean for the ongoing talks in Mexico? Um, thank you, Diego, and, and thank you, of course, to the Atlantic Council for the invitation and, and for addressing this, this very important issue. And of course, uh, muchas gracias. Thank you very much to, to the speakers, to the previous speakers, particularly um, the Venezuelan leaders who have given us, I think, very, very powerful and very important messages. Um, on your uh, two questions, um, on the issue of recognition, um, the position of the Spanish government has not changed. Uh, it is the same as it was in January this year. It's in line with the EU position uh, that's been expressed in, in, in high representative um, statements and, and council conclusions. Um, we believe together with the, with the EU partners that um, the 2018 presidential and the 2020 legislative um, elections did not meet um, international standards, so they cannot be recognized as credible, uh, inclusive, or transparent. Um, uh, we consider Juan Guaido and other representatives of the opposition parties elected in the 2015 National Assembly as, um, as privileged uh, interlocutors, since it was uh, the last free expression of Venezuelans in an electoral process. Um, on the second part, or, or your second question, on the election observation mission um, um, sent by the European Union, we believe that it's a positive step um, um, that the EU sends a mission to, to Venezuela, and we believe it will encourage participation, will hopefully serve also as, as a deterrent for fraud, 
and, and above all, it will produce a set of recommendations um, um, and a very thorough analysis um, of the uh, Venezuelan electoral system. Um, I'd like to clarify because uh, um, I, I've, I've also seen some uh, similar expressions in the media, but the, uh, the fact that the EU sends an election observation mission does not mean uh, or does not imply that the EU agrees with existing electoral conditions in a country, in this case in, in, in Venezuela. Uh, it doesn't mean that the EU uh, validates them. The EU so far has decided um, to send an election observation mission, that is, that, that basic conditions for observation are met, mainly freedom of movement, access, um, um, expression, um, but again, that does not mean uh, that the EU uh, agrees with uh, electoral conditions in the country. Um, EU election observation methodology, and, and as you were saying, I, I've experienced it firsthand, um, EU methodology is one of the most thorough in the world, I would say. So that mission, whose observers, um, uh, whose core team is, is now on the ground, if I'm not mistaken, um, is going to to carry out a very thorough analysis um, of the Venezuelan electoral system. It's going to look at uh, legal framework, um, it's going to look at campaign, media, civil society, human rights, um, political context, um, and of course, women's role in, in, the, uh, in the election. Um, um, I would like also to, uh, to dwell a little bit on that because in EU observation missions are um, really mainstream uh, women's uh, role in women's participation in every aspect of, of what they do. There's normally um, uh, a gender analyst, or if not, there's a gender focal point who makes sure that in the final recommendations in the report that the EU will produce, not only does the EU look at, um, at women's participation, but it also uh, points to uh, action and recommendations um, uh, for, uh, for improvement. So, um, so yes, as a conclusion, I, I would say, um, let us uh, 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 let the, the um, let the EU uh, observation mission do its job, um, and let's not prejudge uh, the final report uh, that it will produce. Thank you very much. Thank you, Director Garcia. That's that's uh, that's a fair assessment. So going back to you, Director General Cohen, um, Global Affairs Canada has vast experience across across the globe in promoting equal and meaningful participation of women in peace building efforts. So what are some of the lessons learned from those experiences and which best practices could be applied to Venezuela in this critical moment in Mexico where key agreements could have profound effect in the future of, of the country? Uh, thanks, Diego. It's a great question and, and I'm really pleased to be able to get into some of the context on this. Uh, Sort of by way of a frame for our efforts to support women's participation in peace building, Canada's feminist approach to foreign policy is really rooted in the conviction that all people should enjoy the same human rights, have the same opportunities to succeed, and to live in safety and security. And central to this, in terms of what we're talking about today, is the women, peace, and security agenda, which is really at the heart of our foreign policy, particularly as it pertains to peace building. This agenda was born 20 years ago when women around the world dealing with war and conflict found many commonalities in their experiences. An important similarity they identified was their systematic exclusion from formal peace negotiation process. Uh, this is the first time women have been included in a Venezuelan negotiation process. And so we, we can see the continuum there. So these women going back 20 years advocated with success for the passing of resolution 1325 at the UN Security Council in 2000. The resolution affirms that peace and security efforts are really more sustainable when women are equal partners in the prevention of conflict and in the forging of lasting peace. I'll share with you just a few of the lessons learned that from our work on advancing the, the women, peace and security agenda, which hopefully have resonance here today and, and can serve as the basis of future discussion. Uh, there's data to back all of this up. Results of peace negotiations are more just and enduring when the people most affected are involved. Uh, when women are included in a peace process, the resulting peace agreement is 20% more likely to last two years. When women are included in the negotiations process itself, the agreement is 35% more likely to last at least 15 years. It's also important to clarify that 
when we're talking about women's participation in these processes, you know, this is not about women being inherently peaceful or about inviting women to talk about what have been incorrectly labeled as women's issues. This is about including a diversity of perspectives representing a large chunk of the population in order to address a wider set of issues and taking into account, into account the voices of impacted communities. And so the, we have examples of this elsewhere, uh, where Canada, for example, is supporting the role of Indigenous women in the implementation of the peace agreement in Colombia. I'm going to share a quick anecdote coming out of Darfur. Uh, 15 women were technical advisors at the negotiations on Darfur in Abuja. They were not at the negotiating table. They learned through this role that negotiations had stalled over access to a river. When they saw the river on the map, they were able to inform the negotiators that the river had dried up three years earlier. This is an example of how this is not a women's issue. This is not about women being more peaceful. This is about the inclusion of diverse views and information from a variety of perspectives and from a variety of walks of life to, as a critical component of successful negotiations. And so our job as the international community is not only to make space for women and women's voices, our job is to support and amplify these voices so they get to where they need to in order to impact decision making. And gender equality and the empowerment of women is really not possible without engaging men and boys. Kevin alluded to this, this rather obvious reality earlier. We need men and boys to be champions of gender equality and women's rights and to be allies of women's rights organizations. Sexual and gender-based violence, I'll come back to this, uh, it threatens democracy and it can limit the full participation and representation of women. This is a factor we have to take into account and something that we have to consider as we move forward in our planning. The UN fact-finding mission on Venezuela and human rights organizations have raised the alarm on this issue. So have our panelists, so have others in this space. And so addressing violence against women has to be at the heart of women's empowerment initiatives in the context of the women, peace and security agenda and in the context of peace building. And finally, I would just say in Canada, we've learned that we also have to be humble as an international community when advocating for gender equality, inclusion and diversity. We still have work to do in our country and I would argue most countries would say the same in an honest frame of mind. Uh, and in Canada, that's especially in regards to Indigenous people's inclusion, and in particular, the situation faced by Indigenous women in our country. We bring that to the table, we bring that in terms of our perspective, and we factor that in, in terms of a more humble and more lessons learned approach as we move forward. Thank you very much, Diego. Thank you, Director Cohen. Yes, it is about improving the like, like ability of, the, of, of having better results, including women in these processes. Um, thank you for that. Going back to you, uh, Deputy Riley, the U.S., uh, mostly through the State Department, but also USAID programs, has supported country initiatives and local efforts that have helped to advance women empowerment and gender inclusion in Venezuela. Um, how can your government provide further political support, resources, and visibility for this Red de Apoyo, a group of uh, 2015 National Assembly women representatives, interim government amb ambassadors, as well as other women-led civil society organizations, especially considering Venezuela's complex and highly uncertain political situation? I'm just gonna focus here on the basics. Um, we need to fo focus on listening. Like Sarah said earlier, we need to focus on uh, amplifying what we hear. Uh, the insights, the wisdom of all the people who need to be around the table. Uh, and that includes that 51% or 50% plus uh, of the of Venezuelan society, those women and girls. And this is about representative democracy. So, you, you know, I always try to pay attention to that word and make sure that our efforts, our policies, our programs align with that representativity. You know, the Venezuelans face this immense challenge of recovering representative democracy. You know, Indira touched on this earlier. Um, and to do so, they need to incorporate, incorporate voices um, that speak for all of Venezuelan society. And so, you know, it it sounds 
almost a truism, but it's actually um, a fundamental uh, that we have to make sure that our programs, our activities um, help uh, Venezuelans accomplish that goal. And so that's the lens through which we have to look at this problem. And so that is why um, we have to listen to that um, majority of Venezuelan society uh, and not um, then not turn away from that responsibility. I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. And that's why these platforms are so important to keep uh, providing spaces for them to, 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 to share their vision, their perspectives, and to keep uh, helping uh, constructively this, this process. Thank you, Deputy uh, O'Reilly. So last question is for you, Subdirector, Deputy Director Garcia. As human rights counselor from the, US, the EU delegation in Bogota during Colombia's peace process, we talked a little bit in the preparation for this event about this, you saw firsthand the benefits and the challenges of minimum, meaningful women participation in peace building. Recognizing the many differences between the Colombia experience and the Venezuela's negotiation today and experience today, what are some of those lessons learned from the dialogue in Mexico and for the dialogue in Mexico? And how can Spain and its international allies help to further promote and support equal women uh, representation throughout this process? Um, thank you, Diego. And, and, and you, you're right that the Colombian conflict and the Venezuelan crisis are indeed uh, very different. Um, but, but there are um, some valuable lessons, I think, that, that we, we've learned in the Colombian process that might be useful. Um, um, I'm going to focus first on the benefits because, well, previous speakers, uh, I think, have, um, have talked about uh, many of the challenges already. And, and, and also, I will I will address the issue of the, how can the international community uh, help. On the on the benefits, uh, I think there are very clear benefits uh, if we look at the Colombian uh, peace process. Um, women's organizations and women negotiators were, were key to the success of the process. Uh, um, and, and I'd like to point out at least in, in three ways. Uh, first, uh, in the first place, I think in, in getting to the negotiation uh, table, uh, women organizations in Colombia really pushed hard and advocated for negotiation. And they were key to actually getting um, the parties to sit at the table and negotiate. They were also very, um, uh, they were also key to, to once the parties were negotiating, um, to manage that they remain at the table despite the, the numerous crises and, and, and the noise that so always surrounds uh, um, peace negotiations. And, and, um, and I think, uh, judging by what um, our Venezuelan speakers have um, addressed earlier, I think that, that has already happened in the Venezuelan um, uh, process. Um, I think uh, women and women's organizations have been key to advocate for negotiation and that the parties remain at the table. We've heard it today. Um, then there's also the, the, the negotiation style. I think President Chinchilla addressed that, um, um, and I believe Sarah also also mentioned it. Um, um, women negotiators have a, have a different way of, of, of addressing negotiations, less confrontational maybe, uh, more focused on a win-win um, scenario, which is extremely useful um, uh, and was extremely useful in the, in the Colombian um, peace process. That's not to say that they can't be um, very hard negotiators, they are, uh, but they just have a, 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 um, a often a, a different approach that is really helpful to make things work um, in a difficult negotiation. And, and then there's, of course, um, the, the substance, um, the outcome of, of the agreement, the, the, the Colombian peace agreement, I think benefits from uh, from from a, a, a wide scope that was promoted by women and, and women's organizations, and uh, um, I think it was uh, Bibi and, and Indira who mentioned it earlier that that uh, it's important to broaden the scope of negotiations. So that certainly was um, uh, in in Colombia, um, women's organizations and women leaders were 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 key to to achieving that, and thanks to that. 
uh, women's issues were addressed in uh, rural reform, political participation, of course, and social justice, and many other areas in the agreement. Now, how can we help? How can the international community um, help? I think it's important um, to um, to put the issue on the table from the beginning, and that's why we believe that that it's positive that and that Norwegian mediators have put the issue on the table now. Because in Colombia, um, if I'm not mistaken, the, the, the gender subcommission was created two years into the, into the negotiations. That women started uh, having a, a role earlier on, but um, I think it is important that they have the issue on the table from the beginning. Uh, secondly, I, I also think, and also learning from the Colombian peace process, it's, it's good to have different modalities of women participation in mind. Um, of course, women negotiators, but also consultations, um, in Colombia, there was a gender subcommission. Uh, that's quite exceptional. But there are different ways of actually um, getting uh, women's views and, and, uh, into the into the negotiation. I think we must be um, uh, we must bear them all um, in in mind. Um, and and lastly, of course, we, we take very very good note of of, of the request uh, that Mariela made um, for the international community to support the process. And not only to support the process, but to support uh, women's role um, and women's participation in the, pro in the process. And um, of course, we will. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you, Subdirector Garcia. Um, and thank you all uh, the, the panelists for joining us today in this important and really insightful conversation. Um, I can say that after three years working at the Atlantic Council, this has been uh, one of my favorite uh, events. We at the Atlantic Council are really committed to continue working to promote women empowerment, not only in Venezuela, but also in the rest in, uh, of Latin America, and we will continue to do so in the medium and long term. Uh, please uh, remember to join our campaign on Twitter using the hashtag Venezuela Necesita Acuerdos, Por favor, únanse a nuestra campaña y ayúdenos a promover este mensaje utilizando el hashtag Venezuela Necesita Acuerdos and stay tuned for more activities to support uh, women empowerment in the region. Thank you very much.